Father, we thank you now for the opportunity to get back together again to for your position of place to meet. But it will keep in mind that it's not the place that the uh, knowledge that you are with us wherever we are, whatever we're doing. We thank you, Father, that you've blessed us so much. Pray that we keep in mind that uh, every good and perfect gift comes from you. And all that we have and all that we are belongs to you. We pray for the meeting today. Just uh, let us gather some things from this uh, meeting that we might take and use to further your kingdom. We pray this in your name. Amen. 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 I'd like to remember to do 2 Chronicles 7 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and refrain from their wicked ways and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Amen. I pray that everyone in here is praying for our nation and our leaders that uh, we would do God's will and uh, He would save our nation bless our nation. You know, one of our members, Mike, uh, has blessed me with some daily promises. This one is uh, Psalm 73, verse 23 through 26. But I am always with you. You hold my hand. You lead me and give me good advice. And later, you will lead me to glory in heaven. God, I have only you. And if I am with you, what on earth could I want? Maybe my mind and body will become weak, but God is my source of strength. He is mine forever. I also, with all the stuff that's going on, wanted to read uh, starting with Isaiah 2 at the mountain of the Lord. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And I consider this to be a warning to us as Americans. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. The commentary in my Bible says, if you see the, the commentary on 2 Chronicles verse 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, in the last days, the temple will attract the nations, not because of its architecture and prominence, but because of God's presence and influence. Hmm. God gave Isaiah the gift of seeing the future. At this time, God showed Isaiah what would eventually happen to Jerusalem. Revelation 21 depicts the glorious fulfillment of this prophecy in the new Jerusalem, where only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be allowed to enter. God made a covenant, a promise with His people and will never break it. God's faithfulness gives us hope for the future. Ask God to help you spread His Word. Amen. Verse 3 says, <coughs> Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, so that we may walk in His paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they crane for war anymore. Come, the descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen. 
Praise God for His Word. It's all yours. <laughs>
That is absolutely amazing. Are you speaking to me? Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. That one more. She's going to tee it up for you. Hey, wait, they got one more. I get it. I get it. I want to hear it. It could have taken a 
I just felt that I would lose one of my friends, my white friends, who I love so much. When I was young, my mom had four children in her stomach for four years straight. All of my brothers and sisters are 30 days apart. We overlap. So she was pregnant for four years straight. And she was this most beautiful black, black woman. She's about five feet tall. And she had such low self-esteem because she was black. And she wasn't accepted. You know what I'm saying. You all know the story. She wasn't accepted. And then my dad, who's six four, about his complexion, <laughs> kind of validated her in some way. This light complexed man loves me. And they fell in love, but it was a struggle for them. I think part of it was because she was um, so stressed out with all these kids, you know? And there was no one there to help her. So she withdrew. She had four kids and I was the eldest of five children. And the responsibility on me as a child was so great that I loved my brothers and sisters so much that I would almost do anything for them. But I didn't want that position. I was a child. I didn't want that responsibility. And back then, children were seen and not heard. So I wasn't able to express what was in me. So all of my life, I carried this thing in me. When you see me, you know, you see someone that's happy most of the time. And I love people. I love being around people. I get my energy from people. But you have no idea. I struggle every day to stay positive, to stay flat foot and to hold on to God's unchanging path. I mean, nobody else really counts but him in my life. Oh, I, mean, there's, I wake up talking to him, all during the day I talk to him, I go to bed talking to him, and I said, help me, Lord, because only you can. Because the examples that I had weren't good enough to take care of me, or to, you understand, to give me what only God can give. They were there, and they expressed their experiences with me, and they helped me along, but they couldn't see me. When people look at you, they look at you through their eyes, well, not through God's eyes, you see? And so I just, I rebelled, believe it or not. I had a, a period of my life where I really rebelled because I was angry because nobody would let me talk. Nobody would help me. And so I created a life of my own, really. I knew how to work you know, in and out of schools and organizations and people, but I was so frightened. My mother baptized herself when she was six years old. No one would take her to church. And she decided, I'm gonna baptize myself. And that's where I come from. She loved the Lord, and she wasn't any kind of expositor, theological expositor. She said, if I don't know anything else, I know that Jesus loves me. This well, come on, That's man. the only thing she ever talked to us about. Mm -hmm. Jesus loves me. Regardless of what things look like, he loves me. So that was instilled into me. I watched her. My mother was always there in my presence, but she wasn't able to be a mother. She wasn't able to take care of me. Because she couldn't. Not that she didn't want to. She just couldn't. She didn't have the energy. My father, before he died a couple of years ago, he left me a letter. And he said, April, you are the man that I always wanted to be. <laughs> that was profound. <laughs> that I was the man that he always wanted to be. <laughs> so I'm living in these two dichotomies. I had my mom and my dad. They loved each other, they loved us, but they just couldn't make it work. They just couldn't make life work. So to make a very long story short, all of these years, I went to Africa in 2003, my very first trip. I didn't want to go to Africa. I didn't really know I'm black, but I didn't grow up in that mindset. Where they have black history, they didn't teach you all of that. And I was almost, not embarrassed, but you know people, you know, you just, they made us look ugly. Yes. The people that I was around, they made, they made it look ugly. My mom was a living example of that. 
But I knew somehow in my spirit that I had to, I've got to get through this life somehow. So anyway, the bottom line is, when I was asked to go to Africa, I, de I declined six times. I'm like, there's nothing in Africa for me. Not at all. But during this time period, my husband and I, after 30 years, you know, most of you know, you know, I ended up getting divorced. But at that moment, God said, I'm going to take you out of this situation and take you put you another. So I was in Africa. When I came back home, it was a beautiful trip. When I came back home, I knew it was going to come home to just April. And never been by myself. From my family and me and my husband, I'd never been on my own. But I had thousands of pictures that I had been working on. And in the process of working with these pictures, I began to put them in groups. And I had this long table in my house. And I always had my mother and my father's voices in my head. I don't care what I did. They were always talking to me back here, you know? And so I started to put these groups of pictures together. And like three months, I was sad, crying, alone. But I had these children around me. And I said, help me, Lord. So I got up one day. I felt good. But what happened was I looked at one of the kids, and I saw the reality somehow. I hadn't seen it before, but I saw reality that, April, stop trying to organize your life. Mm -hmm. So I took my hand, and I slapped everything I had worked for for three months onto the floor. And I just saw it and stood in place and said, Father God, if you don't help me right now, I don't know what I'm going to do. And when I opened my eyes, on the floor were all these children looking up at me. These faces. And I just stood there and I said, what do you want me to tell you? What do you want me to say? And so from that moment until present, I've been manipulating and working pictures and pouring out my life. And what I have created is a book that is me. Just, you're going to see different pictures, you're going to see different scriptures, but it's me that you're seeing. And you're seeing my mom, when she didn't think she was beautiful, I made these children beautiful for you. You know, when my dad said, you know, you're the man I always wanted to be, then my efforts, so my whole motivation is to please my parents. Just to let them know you didn't do anything wrong. You know. You didn't do anything wrong, I'm going to do everything I can. And that could be a negative or a positive, you understand. But I just love them so much and I feel so badly for them because they, didn't, they weren't all that they could be. So that's my thing. I've always tried, as you all know, I'm always doing some type of an art project or something where I can self-express because I want them to say, you did not make a mistake. There's a song called uh, Love's the Many Splendor Thing and the April Rose. Who knows anything about that? Y'all heard that song? Well, that's where I came from. That's the song they named me after. Because my name, my name, name is April Rose. And that's a love song. And they told me that I was made in love, but how much they love me all the time. So I created a book, and it's called Africa Types and Shadows. That's what it is. You can read into that, you can do whatever you want, but that's what it is. And it is just a compilation of um, uh, photographs that I've taken from Africa. And what I have done is, the father gave to me the day I was going to give this book to my grandchildren as a legacy. That's all I was doing, really. Just creating a book to leave, so they could see the work that I accomplished. And God said, this is not just for your children, it's for all the children. Amen. Right? So I have this book with these incredible images in it. And then each, each character is represented by a scripture. Because when the missionaries go to Africa, and they're teaching these Africans about God. God is a, Jesus is a, he's a spirit. Spirit has no color. Yeah. Has no color. But the way that we have received him, you know, of course, is right, right blue eye. Yeah. But when you're talking to a child like I was, I want to see me. I want to see that God loves me too. Even though I know it in theory, to have that visual, because it says Amen. words, a picture speaks a thousand words. Amen. And so I decided that hmm, I'm going to make a book for missionaries. Not, you know, just not for my family, but for missionaries as a supplemental tool to the Word of God. So when they're teaching the Word, they can snap this little thing up and say, the kids can now look at it and say, oh, I could be 
Paul and Silas, or I could be David and Jonathan, or I could be Abraham or Sarah. That's what the whole book is about. And I did not do that on my own. Believe me, I did not do it on my own. And so I just hope that once I get it all straightened out, this wonderful man right here called me yesterday, and he's going to help me do a couple of things. Because God also told me, don't chase. Don't chase. Don't try to make things happen. This is you. It's already done. Don't try to call this person and get this group of people together to support what you do. You don't need to do it. It's already done. It's for you. But I'd love to share it with you guys. And if you're ever interested, let me know. Um, it's a beautiful work. And I'm going to have three. Uh, it's going to be a series of three books because I have so many pictures. I was kind of feeling bad about the other kids. <laughs> I don't want to leave them out. So uh, anyway, it's just beautiful. My life is beautiful. My friends are beautiful. And God loves me so much. I know that now. I know more than ever. Because he gave, he finally let me release Amen. in this book. So, I love you. Thank you. If you want any information, just, you know, just call me here. <laughs>
you want to live twice. We teach people, you only go around once in life, get all the gusto you're going to get. First of all, that's a lie. Because <laughs> you don't go around once. You go around twice. And the first trip sets up the second trip. <laughs> are, we, are we together? Yeah. The power that raised Jesus from the grave is the most amazing power ever demonstrated in the universe. God conquered death. Yes. The only enemy that man could not conquer. Amen. The only enemy that man could not do anything about. And Jesus conquered death. Paul writes about it in Ephesians, and he says in Ephesians chapter 1 that God, with the power of heaven and earth, raised Jesus from the dead. And then in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, and you. Come on now. I don't know about chapter markings for you in the Bible, but it's kind of arbitrary where you put the number 1 and the number 2 chapter. Because it was never written like that. It was always just one continuous line right. in Hebrew and Greek. So when people translate it into English, they break it down into chapters and verses just so we can talk about where to look. Right. But it's not inspired. The markings are not inspired. The numbers are not inspired. Right. Chapter 1 is not inspired. Verse 15 is not inspired. It's all the word of God. Amen. It's all the word of God. And we put chapter 2, verse 1, and beginning with a conjunction, and. But that and connects you to what happened in chapter 1. And you, just like God raised Jesus from the dead with the power that transcends all time, space, eternity, and blots out sin. Come on, sir. That power. And you, hath he made alive. Come on, man. Hath he quickened, the Bible says. Yes, sir. He's quickened you with his same spirit. Yes. So, wow, what does that mean? Well, the offer is on the table. The offer is on the table. You once were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead already, not going to die. Already dead. Not potentially going to die in a dangerous situation. Already dead. Not diagnosed with cancer and need chemo, because if you don't get it for the next six months like they told me four years ago, no, already dead. See, already dead is your big problem. <laughs> already dead. You ain't worried about dying, you already dead. And so what we're talking about is here's the offer. If you are already dead, you need to know how dead you really are. Whether you dead in trespasses and sins. Let's break those two words down. Trespass simply means you're in the wrong spot. You're on somebody else's land. You have gotten off your path. You're on somebody else's land. Trespass. God said, walk this way. Man said, I'm going that way. Trespass. You're going in your own direction. The Bible says this. All men have gone to their own way. They've left the path of God. You dead. Trespass. Sins, it's an archery term. The distance between the middle of the target and wherever your arrow hits is called sin. Either sin one, two, or three. It's an archery term. If you hit the target at all, and it's not dead center, you're going to measure it in sin. So God says, all have sin. And look, and fall short of the glory of God. If your purpose for being here is to glorify God, and you're not doing that every moment of every day, you are dead in sin. And it just means that you can't do nothing about it. Right. You need the power right. of God to declare you righteous. Right. Not work out how you can figure out how to work it out so you can become righteous. Righteousness by declaration is what Paul said. He said, if anybody was going to be saved by the law, I'm the one that's going to do it. I kept the law. I was born, I was sacrificed. I mean, I, I, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm child of Benjamin. I've kept the law. Blameless, he said. If anybody going to heaven, but you know what he said? I gave it, I kept it all lost. 
for the surpassing greatness of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I count it like dung, a pile of crap, is what he said. Keep it. I don't want life by the works that I do. I want justification by God's work. I want this life that comes by faith. Hey, y'all, listen. If you did, the only way that you could be made alive is with the same power that raised Jesus. Now hear this now. The Holy Spirit. When you trust Jesus, it's no less a miracle than Jesus being raised from the dead. When you trust Jesus, the same power that brought him to life is the power that makes you come alive. Here's the illustration. You walking through the graveyard. You walking through the graveyard. You once was dead in sin and trespasses. You shouldn't look like the people who are still in the coffins. You shouldn't be walking around that, and a person who is not saved is a person walking around in a coffin. <laughs> looking like they're alive. But their worst problem is they're all oh, dead. So what is our opportunity here? Believers, we have the vessel. In this vessel, we have the living word of God. In the living word of God that we meditate on day and night, God will use us to let not our words, but his words come out of our voice. Yes. So people can be convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit and be converted by the power of the Holy Spirit and brought from death to life. Yes. So that they walk around not like people in coffins, but people who are free indeed. Free to love God, free to serve God, Amen. free to understand God, free to hear his voice, free to have light and life like they never had it before. So here's the offer. Again, do you want to die twice? Because if you die physically, having not been resurrected by God's power spiritually, you get a second death. That second death, the Bible describes as a place of torment, suffering, flames, and never-ending pain. That's the second death. So here's the offer. Do you want to die twice? Physically once. And spiritually twice. So that you never get to experience the love and mercy and power of God. Or would you, conversely, and every little baby I know, if you give them this option, they will take the ladder. And here's the ladder. It's like you say, I got a bowl of doggy poop <laughs> and a bowl of bluebell butter coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and put them both in front of the baby. I guarantee you that baby's going to have ice cream in his mouth. <laughs> it's in, uninformed as a baby can be, and God puts the cookies on the little shelf for us. He doesn't make this difficult because he wants everybody saved. He doesn't want people to try to figure out, well, what I got to do to get in? How difficult can it be? I know my religiosity ain't really where yours is. I need to get my religion together. Excuse me, Jesus didn't die so you could be religious. He died so you could be saved from death and sins and trespasses. He died so he could rise. He got up so we can get in. This is simple. Do you want to live twice? I'm saying you were born dead. You get made alive once by trusting Jesus. And then when you physically leave this life having served him, let him resurrect in your body, die every day. I wake up every day and I say, Lord, funeral for me, resurrection for you. Funeral for me, acknowledge that all the things I want to do with my life, my spell, my talent, my ability, my skill, whatever you think I've got, whatever you think you got going for you, if it's for you, excuse me, it can't be for him and you at the same time. It's just not priority. Priority means one. First, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Everything you need is going to be added to you. So listen. Godliness with contentment is your great gain. Yes. You don't need the miracle and a big breakthrough in the millions and the millions and millions. For what? What are you going to do with the millions? You're not going to help a million people with it. Will he do it? Why do you want God to pass a million dollars through your hand and you ain't got a plan for how you help nobody with it but you? 
stack it, buy this, live in that, go to this place, have this, video that, put me on display. I made it. Made it to what? He says, if you save your life, you lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake of the gospel, you gain it. Godliness with contentment is your great gain. Okay, so we live this life. And then David says, surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of this life. And, here we go with that and again, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus said, if it were not so, would I be telling you that in my Father's house there are many mansions? If it were not so, would I be the one lying to you? If it were not so, would I stand up here and tell you this? I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll prepare that place and I'll come again and I'll receive you to myself. For there, you may be with me always. Amen. That's the deal. One death, live twice. Amen. Born in sin, shaping in iniquity, dead in sin and trespasses. Go on your own way, stacking your stuff. <laughs> sin means leaving God out of your choice. Sin just means missing the mark of the glory that should come from your life to his. God deals in the economy of glory. He don't deal in money. He don't need your money. Amen. God never built anything he had to take a loan on. <laughs> and you know what he said? Upon this rock I'll build my church. That's the building he's building right now. Us. He's, no, he's going nowhere on the earth that we won't go. Because we're his body. Alive. And going to live again. See, because, see, I just buried one of my best friends. Best friends in the whole wide world. Thursday. Gail Miller established a children's ministry that got duplicated and replicated in 12 churches. She died at 47 years old. Got diagnosed a year after I did with cancer. Surgery, just like me, colon cancer surgery. Now, then she got uterine cancer, and then she got fallopian tube cancer uh, surgery, and then she got her whole cervix and, and everything removed. And went straight to small chemo, progressed to big chemo. Now she's in glory. But guess what? The day. She died well, was the 10th of February. They had a reception for her plan, but they said, we're going to hold up on your reception just for a few days. Billy's coming. Billy Graham came in there the same day that we did her funeral. Are y'all feeling me yet? See, you want people, when you leave here, when you die physically, which is really something you ain't going to be able to tell nobody about, when you die, believer, you won't be there long enough to tell nobody how it felt. Because he said, absent from the body is. That's quick. Absent is? That's quick. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life, and I dwell. See, so when Gail passed away, her mama and her daddy, they missing their baby. That's their fourth firstborn child. That she wouldn't be back here on a day. Because what she's getting right now is not that body that was scarred. Right. Not that body that got burnt with the radiation. Not that body that turned from beautiful olive color to dark burnt skin. See, what is sown in corruption is raised in corruption. Mm -hmm. What you put in the ground when you bury that person is not what's coming up out of there. It's sown in and, and corruption is raised incorruptible. It's so immortal and is raised. Now listen, let me tell you something. I'll finish with this statement. God made you immortal twice. Death came because of sin. Christ died for the sin. He made you immortal again. If you trust him, you are immortal till the day he brings you physically off the earth, but you are immortal for all of eternity, and it's going to take that long to get to know him. 
That's why I can't wait to come. Somebody said, if you die today, what would happen? I don't care. <laughs> wow. If the Lord called me back today, I ain't think about y'all. that I might attain to what is like to be resurrected. Are y'all feeling me? Resurrected believers, listen. We are part of a resurrection community. Are you, if you're not part of the resurrection community, you're not saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you for letting me talk so long. Uh, we're supposed to leave here at 1.30, but uh, it's 1.31. <laughs> thank you right now. We thank you for your expansion. We thank you for your expansion up out of the grave and into our lives, into each one of our hearts, and to the many lives, the many, many more lives that we are touching. We thank you for a fresh anointing today, that anointing that's destroying the yokes. We thank you for the word that has been brought we thank you, Father, for how you are moving in April's life and how she's moving in many, many, many others' lives. We thank you, Father, for the testimony, Father. We thank you, Father, for what you're doing, what you have done in each and every one of us. We just give you the praise. We give you the honor. We give you the glory right now. We thank you how even you brought us into this place, how you've directed us and guided us, Father, how you're continually to guiding each and every person here. We just thank you, we praise you for sending your son. We thank you right now in Jesus' name we pray. Carry each and every member here of this resurrection community out into the community at large with a deeper faith in you, ready to receive the marching orders and instructions to go out into this world, into the highways and byways, and bring others in. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. 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 And thank you, Smokey, for your 
faithfulness for over 30 years. Three, three people on the way. Yeah.